You're on mute. This is like the this is like a Zoom proverb, eh? You're on mute. There You're we go. <laughs> How are you guys? Yeah, what's up? Good. Oh, good, man. Nice to see your face, Ahmed. Yo, where yeah, you been? Like been? Where have you been? <laughs> around, around. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, man. You know, interesting times and what what. But I'm good. That's Everyone's cool. experiencing whatever right now. So. A lot. That's weird. Like there's so many different stories. Like you chat to different people and they've got their own version of this thing. Um, I think I'm just going to make a t-shirt that says, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Because that's the go-to yeah. question. How's it going? You know, are you surviving during the, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just got off. Uh, I just... say, it should say, I'm okay considering dot, dot, dot. Yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, uh, that's also been like my standard response. I mean, things could be worse. I've seen some horror stories um, and stuff, but it's, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, and it also goes, it goes through phases, right? So people are going through different phases. Every time you think you've dealt with something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Something else comes up or you feel differently. It's like, yeah, it's an interesting time. I think I've, I'm okay today is probably a good one. Yes, I'm okay today. <laughs> for now. I'm okay for now. For now. Yeah. 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 Uh, I you hey? Sorry, man. I just interrupted no. you there. No, go no, I was saying, let's just, let's just officially kick it off and just welcome everybody who's coming and then we'll get straight into the conversation. Okay. Um, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Second episode of Final Approval with somebody uh, that both Ahmed and I are super excited to chat to. Um, before we even get there, Ahmed, how are you doing today, brother? I'm doing, I'm okay today. <laughs> okay, today we go. <laughs> A classic callback. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much to everybody who has tuned in. Um, I hope that you guys are okay today. Um, the way we like to run these, um, it's not like a normal interview. Um, we really like to throw it out to you guys, the attendees. So it's a, it's a glorified Q&A session. So at the bottom of the window, you'll notice a Q&A button. Um, if you can throw your questions in there, either at Larissa uh, at Ahmed or myself or all three of us. We're very happy to answer those and we'll keep the conversation as organic and going that way. Uh, we'll kick it off obviously with the question, whatever lead in questions that we would like to throw to her. Uh, but we really do encourage you guys to, um, you know, uh, yeah, whatever you've wanted to know about the world of freelance. <laughs> um, I see we've got one question that's come through already. So here we go. But before we get there, before we get to that question, um, welcome, Larissa. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you did mention earlier on that you're doing pretty good. Um, I'm going to kick it off if you don't mind, Ahmed. Please go ahead. How has work been during the lockdown? Um, look, I think I got quite lucky that um, I've been working from home for quite a while, um, especially over since I've moved from full-time to freelance. So the transition for me was pretty seamless. Um, and I managed to secure a contract for a few months just as this, uh, you know, we went into level five lockdown. So, so I was quite fortunate in that way. Um, since then, obviously, we passed the day 100. The things have transpired, you know, shifted. Um, uh, I'm I, I'm doing okay personally. My business is managing to stay afloat, but I've seen a lot of uh, changes with my clients. You know, really? jobs being yeah, jobs being postponed, projects on hold, uh, people completely shutting down or pivoting. So um, that's been really interesting. Uh, some of them I'm continuing with them on the journey as they're changing and rebranding, and others we've just you know, decided to uh, take time out and just reassess what they plan to yeah. do with their business. So it's been quite um, educational, sometimes scary to have a front row seat to, to those things. But I'm doing oh. all right. Mm. That's, a, that's a nice way to frame it. I mean, we've been, uh, you know, I mean, as I do comedy now, you know, well, amongst other things, you know, and uh, it's been interesting for me as well, uh, you know, since we've started collaborating with brands again, how they've also started rethinking their strategies and how they want to go out. And they obviously couldn't do, they can't do things uh, traditionally like the way they used to. So yeah. for me personally, the, the focus has shifted a little bit where 
they, I, I find a lot of brands wanting to, you know, they say that they want to collaborate with somebody, but they don't really, they just want you to come on board so they can use whatever following or whatever engagement you have. But um, we, myself and my girlfriend, Davina, have been fortunate in that they go, this is what our idea is. We know what you guys do. What can you do? How far can you take our idea? So it becomes a lot more organic, which I think is great. And hopefully, you know, once we come out of all of this, uh, you know, they keep that mentality because that's the way it should be. You know, if you're going to collaborate with somebody, allow them to be them. And whether it's, uh, I don't know, an influencer, content creator, illustrator, photographer, whatever it is, the reason you hire that person is because you really want to extract their skills, you know, out of them. So now it's been interesting. Ahmed, do you want to say anything on that, sir? No, I was just interested in what you guys were saying about... Um the kind of work that you do. Donovan, I've always wanted to know from someone like you whether, which you prefer, do you prefer, because you're, you're not just a creator, a maker of things. Yeah. You're conceptualizing a, and an ideator of, of, of concepts. And, and I find um, a lot of people who have that capability prefer to you know, play that role, a, bigger, a stronger part in that role. So as yeah. an agency, if I come to you and I go, here's the script, Donovan, this is what I want to do. I want you to work with me. Do you prefer rather going, here's the big idea, what can you come up with before you execute? Or do you think it's lazy for the agency to tell you that? Um, what I do prefer, and, and this has been happening quite a bit. Uh, so if there are <laughs> any big creative directors from agencies or whatever listening, um, it is quite infuriating. I'm finding what's happening is um, agencies are getting, and this has happened about four times now in four different briefs that we've gotten agencies will get uh, a brief from a client and kind of go, okay, well, here's the top line thinking, throw the brief to me to figure out the strategy, basically, then yeah. figure out the creative. So then we send it back and we go, yeah, but can I, I've got a couple of questions. Can you answer these first before we tackle the creative, you know? And what I found is that I think there are a lot of agencies out there right now, because I mean, we've never been through this kind of thing, you know, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of um, above the line agencies, there isn't a strong focus on digital and the way digital works. You know, it's always kind of, you know, oh, shucks, we've got to put stuff out on, on Instagram or whatever it is. It's never really part of the full process. So when I ask those questions, you know, I'm kind of met with a lot of like, man, you, what are you saying? Like, we gave you the brief, just, just answer it. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't work like that. I can't translate what you have in your head in terms of, say, a big a TV ad or radio ad into my medium. So we have to go back and forth and find a place that's going to be comfortable enough for, for both of us, you know, to work. I mean, we're dealing with a situation now where there's four concepts that we've got to work on, uh, but the client didn't even give us a brief. They were like, here's this thing that we want you to tell people about, literally. Then I go, this is a very difficult thing to talk about, number one, in the style that you want from me. Can you give me a bit more detail? So we did, a, a, we did one part of it and then they came back and they went, oh, shucks, you were right. Yes, we needed to put all of these things in. Now it's been radio silence for a week because I think personally they've gone, shucks, we need to actually figure out what it is we want to do and not just throw it out to this person to figure out. So it's, it's a very weird time. But anyway, I've got a very, very interesting question here. I think let's get straight into it. Um, yeah. Luandi Leng Anusa says, I imagine that you're probably going to discuss this anyway, but I'm very interested in the relationship between each of your roles in the context of, say, a project we're all working on together. Can you chat about that? Sure. So do you want to break down what your role would be, Larissa, if we were working on something? I mean, I, I, I kind of enjoy um, uh, some of the creative strategy that takes place, you know, before we even get into the creative executional and the nuts and bolts of that stuff. So, um, and, and I've really enjoyed that with some of my clients that I've taken on personally is like, okay, well, let's go back to the nexus of what you're doing, how you're structured, what you're selling and what like the big purpose of it is. So I enjoy starting there. From then, then we start talking about, okay, what is the big idea? What is the proposition that we want to go forward with? And then we talk about what that could look like. So as an art director and designer, 
uh, you know, putting a visual skin on this idea and this communication yeah. really becomes my role. And it needs to be something, not just pretty pictures for the sake of pretty pictures, which trust me is yeah. a hole that I can fall down into for days. So but it yeah. needs to be, yeah, but it needs to be uh, functional. It needs to uh, really communicate the idea effectively and resonate with people. Um, especially now, you know, with COVID-19, I'm sure you guys have seen and everyone who's on the chat, who's in the industry, a lot of the messaging, the packaging of it, ideas are starting to look the same. You know, we're all yeah, starting yeah, yeah. to say the same thing. We're, it's all about empathy, awareness, reaching out, community. Um, and, and that's kind of the opportunity where um, art direction can really help is stand out in that noise, in that clutter, um, that homogenous um, look of things right now. It allows you to do different things. And I tap into many different resources when it comes to art direction. Does it have to be like Don, like you said, is it, is it photography? Is it illustration? Is it content? Yeah. Is, it, is yeah. it something that's shot in a phone versus shot on beautiful like 5D, you know? So uh, all those different decisions are what come into play um, when it comes to collaborative effort. And, and the great thing about art direction is exactly that you get to work with great talents to execute something that's unique and effective across the board perfect oh what a smart answer Larissa. <laughs> did you see you know what Larissa did before we started she put her glasses on to go i know, right. I, know I, that's prepared. A, I prepared i need i need glasses man i need glasses to, <laughs> I'm like talking Larissa. about your role sir in the context so, of say if we were working together so it's interesting, right? Because I think it's kind of connected to a lot of questions that are going to come up and, 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 and the world we're living in now. I mean, if I look at it hypothetically, if Donovan, myself, and Larissa had to work on any project, it doesn't matter what project it is. What's amazing about it is, and Donovan, you and I have had conversations about this earlier. What's amazing mm -hmm. about it is that we would, we would look at the problem as three creative human beings. And that for me is exciting. So you take your boxes out. There are certain competencies. I would look at the three of us and go, we've got three different maybe skill sets are different skills so not even three. But what would be exciting is to be able to lose all those um, titles and those, those business cards mm -hmm. and go, here's a problem. The three of us would sit down and go, this is the problem. And essentially to answer a question a little more specifically, Larissa's starting point is exactly my point that I enjoy most, which is the strategic aspect of it leading very much into creative. Don't know when you were talking about agencies that tell you to solve it, I, that the, 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 the throwback you gave to the agency is what I enjoy, I've always enjoyed most. I've only discovered yeah. this about myself recently. So, so I think that's the starting point all three of us would have is to go like, you know, what is the problem? What is the, uh, how do we solve this thing? What is the angle in essentially the strategy? And then from there on, I think that once we've kind of cracked that and, and, and brainstormed, uh, coming up with creative ideas for that, or executional ideas, we would then raise our hands to say, you know what, I can do that really well, or I can write that, or I could perform yes. that, I could create that, whatever it is, and then split the workload according to, you know, what we feel most confident in. I think that's a really great question because that question actually gets me excited to, to, to hit a problem when you have two or three people who have multi-skills, multi-talents uh, uh, and skills to be able to tackle one problem and then break it up principally into the things that you need to execute with. So, yeah, I, I think I think that is really the question, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, is actually asking what what the future of creativity is essentially, which is collaboration. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a great follow up question to that from Edwin um, Subramani, who says, uh, first of all, he asks, he, he wishes everybody well. Um, how do you market yourself in the freelance space as a multidisciplinary creative? This is Strong question. <laughs> I, think, Don, you yeah. should, I think, Don, you should answer that uh, because I'm always impressed by the self-promotion that you do yeah. Yeah, um, on your platform. Yeah, yeah look, it's, um, you know, Ahmed and I have these conversation, conversations a lot about stripping away titles, you know. So on paper, I studied art and design. I got a business card that said that I'm an art director, you know, so... For a very long time in the early stages, um, I had blinkers on and I thought that that's all that mattered. You know, I didn't think about uh, copywriting and anything out of, you know, what, what falls into the art direction space. 
and very early on, I mean, at Network BBDO where I worked, you know, I, I know I just felt a little too confined because when I studied art and design, I'd studied everything. We didn't study advertising. I did sculpture, I did fashion, I did photography before digital cameras even came out. Um, drawing, fine art, you name it, you know. So I got through the entire scope. So when I left, I left as a curious, creative person who was just interested in the world and how to solve problems in interesting visual ways, you know. So granted, my go-to is the visual side, you know, uh, which is strange because I do comedy now, which requires a lot of writing, <laughs> you know, but I write everything out. But my style is very detailed on stage, you know, so I unpack it in a very detailed way. So that's where the visual aspect comes in. Um, and when I transitioned from advertising to doing comedy, I then, and I hate to use this word completely, I then became the brand, you know? So because I was the brand, um, I needed to do something to get myself out there. So I very quickly learned, um, not learned, I mean, I knew how to do this. I very quickly had to step back and look at all the presentations that I had put together for other brands that I'd worked on and figured out what are the little things that I would, you know, just in a, a mood board, for example, can set everything off. Um, and, uh, you know, started finding my voice that way. Because that's the tricky part. I think within, you know, the ad space in what you do, a photographer, illustrator, whatever it is, same with comedy, you have to find your voice. What is the thing that people will know about you? What is the thing that makes them want to book you? You know, you, you, as much as you're good at everything, I personally think that you need to be known for a thing to make yourself stand out, you know? Um, that's what I've learned during this time. Like I'm, I'm good at a lot of different things, but I, I really want to be known for, um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a particular skill like, oh, he illustrates well. I think it's deeper than that. I like, I think I like it when people go, oh, he, he does, he does, uh, you know, charcoal drawings in, in a very dark or whatever, you know, I like when people start getting deeper with it, when it becomes a style mm -hmm. thing. So how to market yourself in the freelance space um, as a multidisciplinary creative it's, it's such a tough one. Eh? It's, it's a very tough question to answer that actually, because, you know, first of all, I think that you have to communicate that as a whole. I find with a lot of creative people that I follow, for example, who say that they're multidisciplinary creatives, you go into a lot of their pages and there's just a lot of photography. It doesn't say anything about the fact that you're good with typography or with layouts and things like that. I think if you're going to say that, show it to us, you know, uh, last week we, we, we chatted and one of the questions that came up, sorry, this answer is going on very long. One of the questions that came up um, was um, with, with, with Fatuwani. Uh, shucks, I've lost my train of thought now. But it was pretty much centered around, uh, oh, when somebody asked, when you're hiring somebody at an agency, Ahmed, what is it that you're looking for? And you didn't hesitate in saying that as much as I'm trying to hire you and give you an opportunity, you must remember that you still have to be good. I still have to look at this and go, this person is skilled at their craft, they know exactly what they're doing, you know? So I think the trick is just to make as much noise about it as possible. The weird thing for me is I find that creatives are very bad at marketing themselves. Themselves, yeah. Which is strange, yeah. you know? There are very few creative, uh, I mean, accounts that I, mean, that I follow, you know, where I go, shucks, this person understands these platforms, they make a big yeah. noise, they push themselves out there. Um, I really think it's just about putting out as much quality work as possible and pinpointing the things that you really want to be focusing on in the long run, for example, and showcasing those things um, and not just, you know, leaning into one thing. And if you're going to market yourself as a creator, for example, say on social media, I think that when you start posting lifestyle images of yourself and things like that, you're going to start losing us completely, you know, um, and that's another thing that I find happens quite a bit. Um, in these spaces. Um, but yeah, I guess my go-to answer is really just going to be show us all the things that you're good at, convince us that you're good at all of those things and uh, keep pushing it over and over. Keep just drumming away until everybody hears you. And I think um, also the, sorry to interrupt, Ahmed. No, no, I think the, uh, tell us what you're good at and, and, you know, where your passions are and the different interests you're exploring, but also remember where your audience is at. 
Um, so I, I've, I've seen um, people who've taken their personal accounts on Instagram and they've pivoted it into businesses. Now, if yeah. you spent the last four or five years growing your Instagram community around your friends, around your family, they are not your market, right? They're going yeah. to support you, but they're not going to buy from you. So I think do your research and, and actually go to where your audience is. So if you want to work for Nike, you really want to get into a project for Nike or whoever or Budweiser or whatever, go to where they are looking for talent, right? So you can put your work on Instagram, but they might be looking on Behance or they might be looking on LinkedIn. So, so I think the thing is creatives, we feel a little bit grossed out by selling ourselves because we've seen what's That's behind the curtain. It's yeah. really important that we do get over that and promote ourselves. But I think a way for you to control that is do your research, have your wish list of clients and, and go to them and, and have control of that narrative. You know what I mean? So um, I think that's, that's the way that investing in self-promotion can actually start bringing you the things you want. Otherwise, you're putting stuff out there. It's going to exhaust you. You're going to feel scattered. You're not, you know, it's not going to sell yourself well. Um, there's way to do ways to do it that actually you'll see the benefits of self promotion eventually. It's weird. I wonder who started this narrative of you. You don't want to sell out. You don't want to conform to the. I don't know. Level. It's so strange, you know. But it's and the we best do it every thing day. You do for yourself, you know. Anyway, sorry, another, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, don't worry about it. Sorry, I mean, we spent a lot of time on it, but it's such an interesting topic because I don't think, I don't think freelance, I'm thinking back whenever I've had to find freelancers in, in, at, at agencies I've worked at, it's yeah. always come from personal experience of knowing people having worked with it before. Yeah. But, uh, it, and, and I think it, it's such an interesting thing because I think uh, freelancers, uh, I speak generally, they haven't, haven't marketed themselves. Um, I think in the States, you know, even as uh, creatives in the industry, they have like agents, you know, you sign up with an agent and the agent kind of takes care of you, knows, oh, yeah. you, knows what you do, what you're good at, you know, kind of has your back, promotes, gets you promoted, gets you at agencies, you know, and, and I think that doesn't exist here really. I don't believe mm -hmm. it does. But as mm -hmm. we Larissa, I mean, it's quite interesting because nobody actually does that and, and, and all the things you're talking about are also critical that you have a freelance, freelance or um, uh, a career presence online somewhere. Beyonce, Beyonce yeah. is one of, one of them. But like I find when I go in there also, I'm not quite sure exactly what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. And, but but it's, I think it's a critical point to make that freelancers, I think it's, a, it's like a challenge to all freelancers out there, is to be able to um, market themselves, position themselves, um, in the marketplace because there are people who call me on the daily asking me for freelancers and I'll go back to my mental Rolodex of like people that I've worked with and that I think might be available. So I, it's more like an appeal to everyone watching, go like if there are freelancers on you, I think there's a certain amount of work to be done to be able to position yourself and then wherever it is in whichever platform to be able to, because the funny thing is when you look at film directors and you can ask me, I'll tell you, that person's really good with performance, that person's really good with comedy, yeah. this person really thinks, look, and so whether it's intentional, I believe it's intentional in the way that they've marketed themselves or positioned themselves in the marketplace, why do career freelancers not do it? Yeah, no, very true. very true. This is a very nice question from Tracy Lynn King, um, who says, as creatives, we're used to collaborating and finding inspiration in unexpected places, or by connecting with people outside our normal circles. Um, now that we're all much, much more isolated, how do you think this is affecting us, uh, affecting our creativity? And have you found brainstorming or conceptual creative work more challenging? How do you think we continue to keep uh, stimulated and inspired when our daily routines have become much more mundane? <laughs> Larissa, do you, do you work alone a lot as a freelancer or do you find yourself freelancing, I mean, brainstorming with other people? Um, it's, it's a bit of both. I've been fortunate, you know, that it's split right down the middle. So I do work with agencies and then I also have my own clients. Um, 
And sometimes those clients are very collaborative. They want you to be involved in the process as much as possible and give you as much direction, which I think can be really great. Um, and then obviously in agencies, you know, I either get given a copywriter or another art director or CD to work with. Um, and I think it's important, those relationships to avoid things like creative stagnation or blocks is to keep talking to people. I think creatives, we can get quite insular and precious about our process and our work, whereas in fact, the more you talk to people, new voices, um, you know, different opinions, I think it's where the interesting conversations and the unexpected, the great work comes from, you know, the surprising solutions. So I've been quite fortunate like that. In instances when I am working by myself and the client's like, you know, here's like the project, tell me what you want to do, go for it. And I find I'm, I'm by myself. I, I'm not nervous to tap into, or I try and avoid being precious and tapping into other people who I know might be expertise in that field, might be better at it. You know, especially disciplines or industries that I have very little knowledge of. I try and reach out and say, give me more information, give me insights. Um, because I want to go back to that client with not only an understanding of the comms that they need, but also the business, the playing field that they are. I, yeah. I want to be able to throw the jargon and the lingo back to them. So, um, sorry to interrupt you, mm -hmm. I, 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 but I think Tracy's question is amazing. And strangely enough, you freelancing, uh, Larissa, Donovan, you kind of, you know, you work on your own with Davina, Davina a lot, but like... Yep. I actually want to know the answer to this because I left exactly at the time uh, COVID happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm quite fascinated out, uh, to people who, who, are, who are working in agencies classically to answer that question, go, you classically worked in groups of people in the agency. How has this affected conceptual creative work and brainstorming? Like, I don't know if you, uh, Donovan, you and Larissa, I mean, Larissa, that's how I was asking, like working with the people that you used to, within agencies, how have you found that better, worse, has it, has it made brainstorming difficult doing it digitally? Yeah, you know, on that because... but, Ahmed, like, I think there's, I think there has been a bit of a, a loss of, you know, the, the dynamic that takes place in the agency, you know, that those accidental conversations, those spontaneous moments where you do talk to someone and, and, you know, even just walking over to client service or strategies desk to just get clarity on something made such a big difference. Whereas now everything is done by email um, or Zoom call. And, and, you know, as great as this technology is, it's limited, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite contrived as well. So, um, whereas I, I do miss that, just that casualness, that approachability that you have in an agency environment. So yes, definitely there, there, there has been limitations around that. Um, and I think we can find in our desks and we now think of like our desks as just as places to work and not really more than that, which is like a place of play and inspiration and stuff. So, so it definitely has its limitations. Um, I think wherever you can tap into people outside of your industry, outside of your regular sphere, just because you're limited by your machine. I think it's important to make an effort to keep doing that, to talk to engineers, doctors, friends in other industries, constantly checking in on each other, talking about projects you're on. You have to keep the communication going. It's, I think isolation kills creativity. You know, you get in your head, you can't go, you, you really can't go much further than that. So whatever effort you can make to talk to people, keep your mind stimulated, invite play and unexpected things in. I think we have to make more of an effort of that. I mean, I, I would love to go back into agency now and then just to have that experience, you know, um, but I know that we can't. So it, it just requires that much more of an effort. Thanks. That's you know right. for, for me, um, it's been interesting. Like I've, I've obviously approached this differently. Um, I kind of needed this time uh, to learn how to actually start brainstorming again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because I've, 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 a lot of the ideas that we've been putting out, you know, are things that I've been talking about, talking about for a long time. But because I was on stages, you know, traveling here, traveling there, doing this, doing that, always made an excuse not to do this stuff. Um, once that was taken away from me, I was put in a position where I was like, cool, here we go. 
here is your mold skin. Um, you know, let's go back to basics, the basics of brainstorming. What I did for myself was, um, or what we did rather, um, you know, we'd come up with ideas and if it excited both of us, we'd try and get those ideas out as quickly as possible. I wouldn't harp on it for too long. Uh, you know, once you procrastinate too long, especially in a time like this, you'll never end up doing it. You just end up mm -hmm. coming up with all these half-baked thoughts, you know, that yeah. you're not certain about. You're spending a lot more time online seeing what other people are doing. And this is where the pressure came in, I think, for a lot of creative people is when you started seeing other people being productive, people started putting pressure on themselves, you know, going, shucks, I need... Uh, you know, I need to start making stuff, but, uh, and I need to turn it out quickly. I need to do this. I need to do that. And one of the best things I read was somebody said, um, just always remember that this is a pandemic and not a productivity context contest, yeah. right? Which was so powerful for me because I yeah. had to look at that as well. There were times when I felt under pressure to keep coming up with stuff. And, you know, you know, this is not like, um, you know, other jobs you don't know when the idea is gonna come it comes when it comes you know but it you have to start at some point you have to just keep going and let the pen flow um what helped me was going back to basics you know i i really i started drawing and doodling again and trying to get my brain working i started reading and consuming the things that excited me back then when i started um, you know, what were the things that made me want to get into this? I went back to those things again, just to remember, because you can get caught up so quickly, you know, in trends, in uh, styles, in, you know, all of these different things. And that's what you try and emulate, even though it's not your vibe. So I think it's very different for everybody. Um, I think it's very personality driven. There's some people who excel during this time. There are other people who needed the time just to reset as well. Um, but... It's, it's not an easy process, especially in an agency environment where you're used to getting your energy from other people and you're constantly surrounded by creative people all the time, you know, so naturally your brain kicks in. Um, yeah, very, very tough. I mean, I so, think that's... So important. before you get on to the next question, I, like for me, this is something that I think everyone around the world is, is thinking about right now. Yeah. Uh, and you're right, right? So, so, so the, the, the most amazing information you pick up is when you're not seeking it out. And agencies have been a hive of those kind of places where you'll hear a song, you'll hear a phrase, you'll see someone wearing something, someone talking something, watching a film, a video, whatever. And that's all the inspiration that goes into your head that you actually yes. then, you know, deliver something, uh, something creative. And, I, and, and for me, you can't have that. So let's, let's start there and go, okay, cool. You can't have that right now. And that's the question is how do you do the the brainstorming, conceptualizing in the absence of uh, interpersonal um, um, uh, yes. interaction with people. What do you do? And for me, you know, I always joke, people know, people, people who know me know, unfortunately, that I'm a heavy smoker. A lot of the best thoughts have come on the balcony. And this wasn't just time to think on the smoker's balcony because it was time to interact with other people. And I almost feel like there's no way around it. If the only way you can do this, I'll tell you the plus side of it. The, the one thing is, to create our own virtual smoking balconies and have invite a couple of people to talk shit uh, like we're doing now so yeah. that you can at least replicate to some degree uh, some of the stimulus that come, come from, comes from, from, from people. Uh, and then the other thing is just to be, uh, the good thing is, and this is probably I'm not very PC, but we have friends, like Larissa was alluding to, we have friends from other agencies, some of our best friends are at other agencies. There might be something amazing about pulling in people like that to have onto your smoker's balcony, which goes beyond the, 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 the people, the resource that you had at your agency. I think the freedom, the naughtiness to be able to invite a good friend of yours to freewheel with you on a project that you're working on, if you made that a habit, I think everybody wins. But I, I can't imagine any other way of having a brainstorm session um, mm. that with, without actually doing what we're doing now, uh, you know, in one shape or form versus mm. like sitting in a group of people. I mean, that's what we must, that's what we can't have. In the absence of that, I'll, I'll, I'll promote a very naughty thing and say, phone a friend at an enemy agency and have a brainstorm with them because create, the best creative people just want to freewheel. They just want to yeah. have fun yeah. uh, talking shit and coming up with ideas without going, this idea belongs to anyone. So let's invite people to do more of that because the network you're, is there already. You're so right, eh? I think that it, and I think somebody alluded to this kind of question as well, uh, 
where they say the industry feels quite serious at the moment, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. and we've lost that fun aspect. I think that's definitely the key. You know, once you get too serious with this thing, it just never happens. I mean, that's why with me, I get, I get my ideas in the most random places. And you're right, you know, you go out, you go and have a cigarette, so your brain goes into neutral flow mode and boom, you know, that, that, that spark happens. Um, there's, a, there's a question here from an aspiring creative. How does one become a creative director? <laughs> that's a difficult question. Larissa, tell us. Um, look, I, I took a very linear path on my journey. I started out as an intern, a junior designer, then an art director, and then, you know, a creative director. So I did my, I did my time. Um, yeah. and, and, and as much as I think, um, I mean, you guys probably know the term creative director has been so democratized over the last few years that. Like yes. I go onto social media profiles and everyone calls themselves a creative director, right? So, and that can be debated exactly what the value of that is and whether that, that's fair. But I think I, I, I'm grateful for the one step I took in front of the other um, to, to get to that title because I, at the time I felt I was ready for it. And, and I really wanted it. And funnily enough, I was working with Ahmed at Black River when I got the offer to be a creative director at the agency that I was at last for my full-time position. Um, and, and as much as I felt like I was ready for it and did the work and did the research and, you know, um, try to build networks, um, two things happened, right? So the first was is in my interview, I asked for it outright. So the, really? person, the, the ECD who was um, interviewing me, I said, look, I feel like I've done my time here. I feel like I need to explore this role and this responsibility to know if it's right for me and I'm not moving for anything else. And he was like, okay, cool. He put his pen down and he's like, cool. That's not really what we're interviewing for, but I'm glad that you came uh, to me with your, with your request. Let me see what I can do. And he came back and, and found a space and position for me within his agency within a week. So it, it was asking for what you want. And that's really important. If you have ambitions and you have, stuff that you are working towards be upfront with your with your line managers with your seniors about it like be out there don't don't mess around and hope to be recognized one day um like be fair because they are the ones that can help you get to where you want to be the second thing is when i brought it up with armored there was something that i remember the words uh -oh. still stay with me to this day <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad at all he told me to take a step back and focus on the work because yep. the rest will follow. Um, because I think sometimes we get very romanticized by titles. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's really lovely to call yourself a director of this, a founder of this. I mean, uh, there's a CEO, a friend of mine made himself a CEO of his own company the other day on LinkedIn. I was like, no one made you the CEO. What? <laughs> it's like, congratulations. But the point is that, you know, these, these are very intoxicating looking at these titles and actually those things will come at the right time. If you just mm. knuckle down, focus on the work, focus on what you're doing, better your skill, someone will recognize you for that. So don't be so quick to go after the big fish, you know, um, to right. just, just like you, it, will, it will come at the right time. Just keep doing what you're doing and get better at what you're doing. That's what Can I would I say. That's thanks, Larissa. I thought I said something really bad to you in one. <laughs> no, not at all. Still to this day, Armin. You know, it's one of those things that I think at the time I was like, eh, that's not really the answer I wanted to hear. But <laughs> but looking back, but this is the thing, right? About about um, being a hungry, um, you know, really ambitious um, creative is you you want all these things and you think they come in the form of accolades and incentives and actually. Yeah. Um, it's it's really looking back at your portfolio and your work and being proud of the work you did and knowing like man I fucking aced that yeah. um, and and those those other things will come they they will yeah. so it's, I've always I've always held those words very dear so I do appreciate it Ahmed. not to kiss ass yet I'm really <laughs> thank you yeah. so it's interesting I, I'm like but great advice I really want to jump in here because I've had conversations like this in my career a lot. Um, about people who want to get to creative director. And, and it is a very sexy title. 
and it's uh, and it's also not just sexy it's also you know it does um confirm growth like we go like oh i've been doing this for a while where yeah. to next am i not getting acknowledged for my time for the quality of work so it's not a bad thing to want that at all mm-hmm. there's a couple of things i just want to say firstly like you know I've seen so many people who wanted to be creative directors become it and then go, I don't want this. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I actually like wish I was, I was doing what I was doing before. So that's the one thing. But one thing that I've always hold, held very close to me and very, I, I've, I've stuck to this, and I've said this over and over again in every agency that I've been at, is that I don't, the ECD or the, uh, the, the CCO, whatever it is, does not appoint a creative director. The people around you appoint you. And, the, and this, I, I, like, I, I still believe in it 100%. Most of the appointments that I have made into creative directorship and, and ECD levels in my career have come from people on the ground already treating those mm-hmm. individuals like their creative directors. They've gone to them, asked them for help, asked them how good their ideas are, uh, have respect for those, for those individuals to go, yeah, I trust you to make something better. And, and it's amazing because you don't even realize it, but organically people are drawn to certain people, not, sure. not only from their capabilities, but also from, from the softer issues, which is their leadership skills, the way in which they can be honest, but firm and still um, uh, not damaging uh, or enhancing someone's work or teaching and learning people. So people generally don't consciously think about it, but they will go to those individuals that make them better essentially creative directors. And I've observed people and I've seen, okay, cool, that's been happening for five months, six months, whatever. There is an opening there. I literally, the business card or the payslip that says so and the letter that says so is a formality. And I think that, that when, once you receive it in that way, where you go, my people have already appointed me, my agency now made it formal. I find that that's a much easier transition into becoming a creative director. And so anyone aiming to be a CD, or an ECD or whatever it is, you have to behave as one, you have to be as good as one, uh, and, and then, then the title will come to you. Uh, and if it doesn't come to you, then you definitely can stand up and say, like, you know, why not? If I'm, everyone's looking to me to help them anyway. I'm doing more than my fair share. I'm doing all of that stuff. I should then get my, my, my title. And Larissa actually said it earlier. She said, um, become a creative director, the rest will follow. Yeah, the rest exactly. doesn't come, my friend. It gets busier for you, and you will not rest <laughs> when you can't. Yeah, it's, it's, so don't, it don't walk into that role. <laughs> don't walk into that role lightly because it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a lot more than a business card. Um, I'll tell you, you start being brought into rooms with some difficult conversations. You know, you get to see behind the curtain, um, yeah. and and I think it takes a lot of strong will and perspective um for you to for you to really step up to the plate for that role and and like a you know again you have to be ready for it like Ahmed said like you need to be recognized as someone who can handle those tricky situations and is responsible responsible enough to be in that room um it's it's awesome to be a creative director um i enjoyed it in terms of uh what you can do in terms of facilitating young talent you know shifting that um, directive in the agency really like nurturing um, but you do need your organization you do need everyone around you to also play ball and that's where being in that leadership role can get quite tricky and, and sometimes be quite heartbreaking so also as great as the title is know also where you want to be a creative director okay do your research the right agency the right people it's it can be tough it can be very tough all right, we, we, we are running out of time quickly, um, and we've got some very important questions that I think we need to get to. So, I mean, if we can just tighten our answers here. I think yeah, this next idea. question, uh, Larissa, is, is an incredibly important one from Shalisha Hira, who says uh, she's Shalisha. a girl. Is it a... It's Shalisha, yeah. It's a girl, yeah. Um, in, in this five plus, yeah, you, you never know. Five plus years, thank you. Thanks to Mr. Ahmed Tilly, so shout out to you, sir. Um, Shalisha is thinking about freelancing, but has no idea where to start. Any advice on where to start this process? And is it advisable, Larissa, to start freelancing? Um, very, very tough question that, because I think it involves a lot of personal introspection, right? So 
Um, freelancing was never something that I always wanted to do. I thought I was going to stay in agency my entire life. Um, but um, I, I was, I decided to do the freelance thing because I was really ready. So I had things lined up. I had a client lined up and I had a contract lined up. That was very important. I was just, just going to go out there and freewheel it. So, and that's because I had to check in with my own tolerance, my own discipline. So know yourself very well. If you're someone who gets nervous when you can't make the rent, know that about yourself, right? If it's going to keep you awake at night. So freelancing is up and down. So make sure you have either a client or you have something, a contract in the works that you can go to, or you have three to six months runway finances right so so really go into it quite prepared um and and not just because you think it's an awesome um you know it's going to give you all this freedom and stuff so so be quite prepared for it right now what's happening with the pandemic i would say take five <laughs> because uh, <laughs> because um it's really tricky out there. The market has changed. Agencies are asking freelancers to reduce their rates quite a bit um, because they understand that they have stuff they have to get out, but they also have to be realistic about budgets and clients. So take five, see how it goes after this uh, pandemic, this time that we're in, and then check in with you and your partner and your prospects before you make the jump. It's, it's, it's a great thing, but also going to it with a bit of thought. That's what I would say. Great advice. That's incredible advice. This is another great question here. And I think this goes back to what we were chatting about earlier on um, this person, here, an anonymous attendee says, I struggle with the balance between releasing free content to be known from a wide audience and actually having income from the art. Um, in fact, in the free release of content, there might be a cost from hiring a graphic designer, promoting posts, how to make it viable. I think what they're trying to say is that, uh, you know, they don't really want to put out as much of their free stuff as possible because then it's there, it's out there in the world. Um, but I think, I think, I, I don't, I don't know, like for me personally, I go, but then how else will we know about you? You know, I think that we are also in a time right now where everybody has access to these platforms. I, I look at something like an Instagram, for example, I'll keep going back to Instagram. I think I find it, uh, you know, if you find a, a clever way to use it, it can be for me personally, as a comedian, a 24 hour stage to perform on, but it's also a portfolio, you know, uh, that you can showcase to whoever if you use it in the right way. And um, I just believe that, I mean, how else are people going to know and want to pay you for your skills if you can't, aren't showing us what you can do? The fact that everybody has this platform and that we all have access to these platforms, it's not like before, you know, makes it much more difficult. So it's a gift and a curse, you know, we're all lucky enough to be able to put our work out there and share it with the world, but tens of millions of other people are doing the exact same thing. You know, so I think you really have to button down and give out as much free stuff as possible because I can tell you this for free that it all does come back. Um, you know, unless you are absolutely incredible. Once I land on that page where I go, Jesus, I don't want to look at anything else. This is the person that I'm going to. I might just keep scrolling, you know, and then just find the next person who pops up because that's how this the system works, you know. So I definitely think that you have to let that mentality go and really start putting out as much as possible. In fact, I will have a tendency to want to work with and collaborate with the person who's comfortable enough to put a lot of their stuff out because it shows me that you're into this thing and there's probably a lot more in the tank. You know, how do you guys yeah, feel? Agreed. Yeah, I agree. I think Fatuani said it last week, remember Donovan? In, uh, he basically said put a lot of yourself out there and then as... Donovan said it'll come back. Also, the other thing is the social media is a great leveler. So you've got to be honest about it, things. That everyone's putting content out there. So the, the f first part of the question is, you've got to put yourself out there so that people can see what you can do. Your, your work is your advertising, it's so, so to speak. But then also understand that you're competing with the, the whole world. And so your content has to be really amazing for it to stand out. I mean, I want to give a shout out to a guy called Katlejo that I've been following on Instagram and he does... 3D uh, illustration. It's just, anyway, my point is I've been watching his work for a long time. He's put his work out there. It looks, ama looks amazing. The first opportunity I get, I'm going to be using him without question. And, and so, you know, he could have taken the, he could have taken the, 
the view that if I put my work out there, someone's going to copy it or whatever, but actually yeah. his work, and it, it's taken a long time. I've been looking at his work for over a year and I'm hoping that one of these days very soon I can use him and mm. you've got to, you, your quality has to be amazing and then you've got to put it out there and hopefully things yeah. will come back to you. Mm. Ahmed, if you don't mind, sorry, Larissa, can I just step in there very quickly? I think if we're going to be incredibly realistic here, what I'm finding is people are starting to pay a lot more attention now to um, creativity, number one. Finding a lot of things that are being shared are, you know, interesting illustration, there's conceptual stuff. And one of the reasons why that's happening is a lot of the stuff that's often, that you're often bombarded with on Instagram, you know, it's a lot of vanity related posts. A lot of those people who post that kind of content can't really operate during this time because they're at home. You know, so all of that stuff that you're used to seeing has now been put aside. So this is actually a really great window for you to put yeah. your stuff out. You know, people might actually just stop and pay attention to what you're putting out during this time. But I think you have to be smart. You know, like you say, you're competing against the rest of the world. Unfortunately, you have to be better than you think you are. You know, it's got to be outstanding because we just keep scrolling. You know, and it's, it's you against the thumbs right now. That's really what it's come down to. But this is a really great window for you to focus, to focus and put your stuff out there because mm. the chunk of what these platforms are known for that's been put on hold. Mm. Um, I'm trying to see if there's another question here that we can throw at you, Larissa. This is an interesting question um, from Katrin Hrobler who says that um, I've worked in the marketing client side for 20 years as COVID, I've started to do consulting. Um, I've, I've no idea what to charge. On, and also on some briefs, I'm collaborating with a few people slash agencies. How do I make sure that I get my share if the big ideas are from my research and from my work, even though they're executing? I'm very bad at standing up for my share, which I think a lot of creative people are. Um, and money is often a taboo uh, subject. We don't talk about it a lot. Um, I'd actually like to know from you, Larissa. I mean, the money thing from a freelance perspective, for example, how does that work? Yeah, wow. You know, freelancing and pricing is a topic that I think, oh, you, yeah, there have been books written on it. I mean, it's just <laughs> manifold. And I think, um, like a few things there, I think it's very important for you to, money is not a taboo topic, so you have to get over that. Like, I think it's yeah. very important. You deserve to be remunerated for what you're bringing to the party. And the minute you take that, you know, you treat it as a very sensitive topic out the window, you're going to feel a lot more empowered and, and I think um, stand up for what you want. So, so really approach it head on. Don't be, don't skirt around it. The second thing is there is no one formula for pricing. Okay. So um, it really does depend on the client. When you're working with smaller agencies or you're working with individuals or you're working with bigger agencies or corporations, you need to work out packages and prices that you are comfortable with. If you are sending out a quote uh, to a client and they respond too quickly, you're too cheap. If you don't hear from them, you're too expensive. So you have to kind of find your, your comfortable spot in between there and do research. Again, don't be scared to talk to other people in the industry. Ask, like, what are you charging for this? You're a consultant for this. What do you think it is? Does this make you uncomfortable? You know, start sharing that information and then see where you are going um, and, and how you can position yourself. Of course, again, based on your experience and the size of the project. Uh, find out what the project involves. So are, you, are they trying to get leads from that project? Are they trying to sell a certain amount of product or services, hours, whatever? Work out, okay, if, if they're going to get 200 Rand off every uh, 1,000 leads or whatever, I'm going to charge X amount. That's the percentage I'm comfortable with. So build that into your pricing structure because you are contributing to them building their business. So don't undersell yourself. You actually have a bigger role to play. So keep that in mind, you know, that, that amount. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, I, I think like have an honest conversation. I found that when I send out project proposals or cost proposals, I found out that, you know, I'm, creators are notoriously bad at estimating how long a project's going to be, right? We're just terrible at it. You know, we're either over or we're under. Yeah. Um, that's why I thank goodness for agencies and the people who work there who can filter that stuff. But when you're a freelancer, you have to do that yourself. So um, what I found that work, that's worked well for me is 
get the budget in the room or on the phone call, right? So ask them, okay, have you put aside X amount of money for this? How much is it? If they forthcoming with it, often it's more than you thought it was going to be. Or if it's too little, be upfront about what you're willing to do and then cut it off there. You know, don't go and value add for no reason, hoping like that. Da, da, da. Don't, don't put yourself in a position that's uncomfortable. So like, like I'm saying, there's, there's so many ways to approach pricing. But uh, the best thing is, uh, what, what I found is get a budget, do your research, so talk to people, and uh, don't be scared to keep harping on about money. Get over that. If other people are, if other people are you see, are getting paid for very little, mm -mm. step up and say like, no, my contribution outweighs theirs. I would like to get incentivized. And, and some clients actually do appreciate that. And those are the clients you want to keep working with. Yeah. Uh, if I can respond to Katrin, for me, I'm, I'm exactly the same person she is that most creative people are. Don't want to deal with money situations and issues. But I think I think comp pay compensation is the question. When I when I jumped uh, into consulting and budget commerce, I thought what I was going to do <clears throat> was solve clients' problems that they couldn't solve, and by ask them what the solution would be worth to them. And then how much of that would they be willing to share with me? That was the intention yeah. to go. I, I wasn't interested in agencies, um, you know, taking agencies business, all of that stuff. I just wanted to get into it and go, you've got this business problem that nobody seem, can seem to solve, whatever that is, uh, obviously marketing related somehow, and go, okay, cool. If we, I fix this for you, how much more money would you make? So let's say they say they're making a million rand. I want to know, well, if, if I fix that problem, you're losing a million. If I fix that problem, do I get 10 or 20% of that? Uh, whatever, whatever the amount is. Uh, and then COVID happened. So now I, um, I've been consulting for agencies. And what you tend to do is go by the, the norm, which is you get paid for your hours. And that's yeah. not the right way to get paid. Because, um, you know, the effect of the hours that you're spending, obviously, is far longer lasting and worth a lot more, but you're getting paid only for your hours. And that's, I guess, the same thing agencies themselves are struggling with. So the, the costing model we all know has not been solved. My, my, the thing that I'm trying to do, and I'm, 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 I think, Katrin, to answer your question, you have to have the conversation up front, right up front, as Larissa said. And to go, okay, cool, what are, what are you asking me for, as Larissa said? What is that worth? And how much of that do I get? And, and not resort to, we have an hourly rate budget of X amount for your freelance work. Um, if, if you believe you're gonna be giving them something more than just finishing work for them. And that conversation needs to happen up front. Very few agencies are open to that because it's a waste of their time. They just wanna get on with it. Uh, I think clients might be more open to it to go, listen, if we can capture this market, whatever, we stand to make that much of money. It's a little more scientific. If you can capture that market, whether it's a line that you came up with or a big idea or a strategy, you know, I think you can have the conversation, but you have to have it up front. And, and I think you've got to start out by telling them, I, I charge by hour for my time, but I charge for my value and this is the output. So it has to be measured somehow and have them agree to that up front. And then what happens is the gun to your head is, you know, our livelihood. So you go, shit, they're not going to give me this. I've got to make a call on whether I'm going to take the hourly rate or not. Uh, and that's yeah. ultimately the reality of life. And we tend to do that. We go, I have to settle on that rate because I've got to, I've got to put food on the table. But I think the point is more about um, an, a, a, a charging model that needs to change. No one's cracked that. I believe the conversation can only be had with a CEO of a company who understands the value of an idea in terms of a bottom line. And then you can get paid fairly. I've yet to find someone who's managed to get that right. Yeah. Um, not an easy one. Yeah. I think so. Just, just to lastly jump in there, I just think like, Ahmed, what you brought up is quite important. You have to really check in with the minimum amount that you're willing to be happy with. Because obviously the circumstances we're in now are really, really tricky and unprecedented. So they are going to possibly negotiate you down. Whatever amount is that's like your 
that you will not go further down. Make sure that you have made peace with that amount so that when the client is calling you at odd hours or you have to work a few minutes late, that you are not resenting them, avoiding their calls, you know, being, you, you, uh, so make peace with that amount um, as soon as you can. Lovely. This is another great uh, question here, Larissa, and I mean, might be the one that we potentially close off on. Uh, what would your words of wisdom for graduates who are wanting to enter the creative industry be in a time like this, especially those who might have fears or uncertainty about what the new creative model looks like? It's very interesting and obviously want to decide between agency or freelancing. Oh, man. Um, that's very, very tough. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, like everything, you know, things are cyclical. Um, I think, just keep in mind that this is temporary, okay? So you're walking into um, a, an industry that is just like every other industry shifting and we're making up the rules as we go because we really don't know how long this is going to carry on for and no one could really prepare for this. But know that it is temporary. Um, go in there, um, again, focus on the work, give it your all. And uh, if you um, can adapt and shift and show that you are um, important and a valuable contributor to that agency, you'll stick it out. You'll be there once all this is over and tough decisions have to be made. So I would just say um, this, this tricky phase, it's, it's temporary. Um, just focus on what you're doing um, and keep going. Personally, I think that the, this is a very good time to practice your craft if you are a creative person because mm -hmm. now more than ever do we need creative people there's yeah. so many because we've been faced with this this thing you know and yes, yeah. it's very clear it's very evident that there are a lot of models that haven't been thought out properly we've been coasting quite a bit um, and now we're faced with all of these challenges you know and um, you know, people are having to solve these and, you know, the people who are trying to solve these aren't people who are qualified to solve them. So the people who should be working on these projects aren't. You mentioned earlier on about how, you know, all work looks the same at the moment, you know, and I, I've, I've, I've actually, it, it's been, it's been bothering me quite a bit. Like we've, I, I look at a lot of the Hi, sorry, we got cut off there. Yeah, I don't know what just happened there. <laughs> I think I said, we still have a couple of people on here. I'm not too sure where I, because I just carried on talking until I realized, oh, shucks, everybody's frozen. I thought you were all just listening intently. <laughs> oh, did it get, did it get, did it get cut off from, from, from the Luri, from the Luri side? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Um, we do need creatives to solve problems like this. <laughs> I thought it was just me. But just to reiterate on what I was saying, I think this is uh, now more than ever do we need creative solutions for a lot of different avenues. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, and this alludes to our thing that we spoke about earlier on about even though you're a, an art director, for example, and you work in an ad agency, this might be the time to stop thinking about just ads. You know, you're a problem solver. You know, where else can you apply your thinking? Like you have a gift, you have a skill, you, you're able to take very complex things and, you know, turn them into something that, you know, could help save the world. So I think for me personally, to answer that question, I think uh, go for it, you know, um, take on as many briefs as possible, whether you go to agency or freelance. If you do go to agency, start projects on the side right now, because I think um, a lot has been exposed you know, a lot needs fixing. 
Um, and if you're ever looking for a brief, they are there. I don't think you need a formal brief to try and solve the problems of the world right now. I mean, it's such, a, it's such an interesting question that because we're sitting in this place where agencies are contracting. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a reality that I just want to acknowledge here is that agencies are contracting. It's still going to hit South Africa agencies. Some of the agency businesses generally are closing down. Um, I'm sure retrenchments will follow soon. You've got a young person who's always wanted to get in, who studied, and is now coming into an agency environment or an advertising environment asking, you know, how, how solid is the industry and, and that's a tough one. I, 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 however, because I think the only thing that makes it a little more positive is that it's not exclusive to the advertising and the creative business. Yes. It's everywhere. So you've got to ask yourself the question to get into the industry if you're asking, do I get into this industry because of what's happening right now? It's uncertain. Question is, it's, um, you know, is it any more certain anywhere else? And the answer is no, firstly. Secondly, on your point, Donovan, I think I think if I were agency, I would definitely hire more younger people. Yeah. yeah. Makes financial sense to have younger people into the industry and keep a lot of the senior people to be able to do things. So it's like a lot of thinking to be done at the top of these agencies. I think that as a young person, like in any industry that you get into, if, you, if you're really good at what you do, any industry, if you really love what you do and you're really good at it, you'll find a home in it. You'll find a living in it. You'll find success in it, but don't go in there to see if it's an industry that you can, you know, be, uh, uh, find consistency or find a, a, um, a longevity. I think what yeah. you've got to do is go in there and say, I'm doing this because I absolutely love it and, and I'm going to make it the best thing I've ever done. Um, and that attitude should get, you, should get you noticed fairly quickly in an industry right yeah. now that is struggling and that is, every, that is everywhere. So I think that as a young graduate, I think you don't, don't get into an industry, get into actually make a dent to shift the needle, to make sure that you, you don't just blend in there, you stand out and some new energy comes in and go, the young guys are showing us how to do this thing. So it's not about what the new model is. You've got to go in there and, and actually create the new model going, I like to work this way. You don't have the baggage of sitting in, in boardrooms brainstorming or uh, you know, what you, you do, whatever you do, entering the industry. So yeah, I think, I think we need young people, we need creative solution people, and the industry needs you to get in there so that you can help it change, because that's what it needs. Yeah. Change. Yeah. Very much. That's exactly Very much. it. Guys, I think that um, I'm going to leave it there with the questions. Um, Larissa, any parting words from your side? No, just thank you so much for um, bringing me on board to be a part of this. It was so much fun. And so cool, good man. Luck, good luck to everyone out there. I know it's I know it's hard. I think we're just at the beginning of of this chapter in history. Um, so um, just remain positive and and yeah, keep going. Yes, compassion always wins. Ahmed, thank you. Brother. Yeah, I just, want to, I just want to say thanks, if I can, Donovan, before we cut off to Larissa. It's so nice. And, and, and your, your, answer, your answers to some of the questions were like absolutely spot on. It's just amazing Fantastic. to have learned from you. And then I have one question to end on, Larissa. It comes from someone anonymous who says, who was your favorite copywriter to work with? And, ah! why, was it, and, and why was it Joanna Court? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, so, Joanna. I mean, like, who else can compete at that level? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Larissa. Donovan, Donovan, you got a parting shot there? Um, yeah, once again, uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Um, this is our second episode and it feels like we've been doing this forever. Um, we said this last week as well that, you know, we could go on for two hours, you know, mm -hmm. with these conversations. Larissa, you're, you're fantastic, man. You know, uh, um, I, 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 you know, every time I, I spoke about I this, I tweeted it. Every time I put it out on Instagram, the comments were always like, oh my gosh, Larry, oh, Larry, Larry. People <laughs> love you. And I mean, it's, it's, it's evident, I think, you know, you're, you're such a pleasure to work with. And uh, um, just before we do let you go, um, Ahmed, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Uh, it is Larissa's birthday tomorrow. So, hey. yeah. <laughs> so happy birthday for tomorrow. I wish we had done this 
tomorrow. This would have been amazing. Oh. So if you are still on the chat now, please do send Larissa a happy birthday message. Uh, there we go. There's it. Already, already coming through. And Simone is on. We've actually got Simone on um, on our next episode next week. Oh. Tuesday. Um, Simone also incredible, incredible. One of my favorite people. You're gonna. Love oh her. yeah, yeah. No, she's she's fantastic, man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I mean, we can't thank you enough for your time. We can't thank you enough for your advice. Um, good luck with whatever you are going to be working on. Um, anybody you. out there who isn't following Larissa's journey, please do so right now. Trust me, this is the person that you want to be learning from. Absolutely fantastic, and we hope we get a lot more Larrys. Um, out there we definitely need it but yeah thank you guys for tuning in remember um, you can still enter the Luris. the deadline has been extended till the 15th of July um, the Young Creatives Awards that is one that you definitely need to enter so if you've never had an opportunity before this is the opportunity because it is free so go mm -hmm. onto the Luris website enter your work um, you know hopefully are you you're not judging anything by any chance Larissa Ahmed or Luris? No. No, no. I haven't been invited yet, so we'll see. Oh, uh, shade. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's end this meeting very quickly. Uh, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> and sh shout out to Brand SA. For jumping yeah, on. definitely. You know, shout out to Brand SA for putting this together. Um, shout out to Luri's as well. And, um, you know, to Ahmed Telly. You know, we know he's very busy. Uh, you know, he's jumping. He's probably, Ahmed is probably like running two different sessions here. He's got hours <laughs> busy with somebody else on the side. Um, always a pleasure chatting to you. Always a pleasure, um, you know, hosting these things with you, Ahmed. Um, but yeah, Thanks, tune in next week, Tuesday, 12 o'clock. We've got Simone Bossman. Um, and then, yeah, we've got a couple more episodes after that. This has been fantastic. And this has been final approval. I am Donovan Goliath. That is Ahmed Tilly. And that is Larissa Elliott. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day and just enjoy the rest of the week. Good luck. Stay safe and wash your hands. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.